Welcome, Faith Church. So great to be with you this morning, and I'm excited to, to dive into the book of Ephesians with you, one of my favorite books in the New Testament. And uh, this morning, as we gather together, I'm thinking back uh, to where we were a week ago in, in the second week of Ephesians. In this first part of the book of, uh, uh, book of Ephesians in chapter 1, uh, the Apostle Paul begins to lay out for them uh, this great list of blessings that they received in Christ. And one of the things that I'm really struck by is Paul's ability to help us understand how we've moved from one position to another in our relationship with God. That we were once not a part of God's family, but in that early part of chapter 1, he says we've been adopted into God's family. So now we're a part of his family, and in doing that, we've taken on a new identity. And I'm just really convinced that what Paul wants to speak into our lives through this book is this idea of how do we really embrace the new identity and how do we live into that new identity. And he's going to show us a little bit more about how that happens in Ephesians chapter 1, 15 through 23. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to get it out and read it with me and, uh, and, and to really just give your attention to God's words um, and then we'll unpack it a little bit together in a moment. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23 reads like this, For this reason, ever since I've heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Well, as I look at this, this uh, passage that Paul has given us in this letter that he's written to the Ephesians, I'm just really struck with the change that he's made as he dives into this prayer. Sometimes we look at the content of, of a passage in what we're reading and we can miss some of the other communication that's happening. Like, why would Paul pray now Uh, for them after he's already done this introduction. Uh, How cool is it that Paul prays for them and writes out what he's praying for them as a record for them to be reminded? Uh, I think that Paul places this here because he really wants to see a shift in their understanding of what it means to have relationship with God. He started with with a whole truckload of doctrine all the blessings and all the ways that God has made us uh, new in his family and he's invited us into his family and he's given us so many amazing spiritual blessings. But Paul is making a shift here where he now wants us to begin connecting uh, our heart with his heart, uh, with God's heart, not Paul's heart, God's heart. And this idea that, uh, that really to grow in that identity and to grow and really uh, accept these things that God has done for us, we have to be willing to connect our heart with his. Now you look at this, it says, for this reason, that's that whole list that he's given us. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Uh, so clear here that, that Paul has uh, recognized that their, their evidence of their life, of faith and love, really makes a difference. It demonstrates that they're, they're really in Christ. We talked about that a lot last week, that in that first section of the chapter, he talks about in him and in Christ, and that's so important to who, who we are in relationship to God. And this demonstration of being in him, that they had faith and they loved. Such a great thing. And I would hope that's true of our faith, church that when people think about us and talk about us, that they see our faith and they see our love as a mark of being a part of God's family. Uh, Paul says, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Just this heartfelt moment where he's, he's thinking about them and he's remembering them and he wants to tell them that he remembers them. Why? Because he, he's proud of them and he's proud of, of, of who they've become. And not for himself, proud for himself or boastful of himself, but really just thankful to God for the work that he's continued to do in them while he's been away. So I'd like you to think about this letter in regard to a story. Sometimes we see the words in these long sentences that Paul writes, and we miss that that there's a story behind this. And the story goes like this. Paul is sent out by the church in Antioch to go and take the, the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentile world. And at one point, he ends up in the city of Ephesus, and he plants a church. He literally leads people to Christ, helping them to discover this new relationship and a church is formed and leadership is put in place and eventually Paul moves on 
And he writes this letter from Rome. Some years later, he finds himself imprisoned in Rome, and he's writing correspondence to some of the churches that he had planted along the way. And so as I think about the, the six-fold part of this story, uh, they came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that, the people from Ephesus. And they showed love for God's people. And Paul heard about this. Some communication was sent to him that told him, hey, here's what's happening in the church in Ephesus. And he, because of what he hears, he gives thanks for them. And then he remembers them in his prayers. And then he tells them that he doesn't stop doing this. He just continues to remember them. And so as we think about diving into this part of the, of the chapter and this part of the letter, thinking about in story form, what can we learn from that? What can we learn about what Paul was seeing in them? And I think one of the things that we see is that Paul cared for them. Paul cared for more than about giving them information. He cared about helping them to take that information and find a way to express it in the way that they lived. That's their faith and their love that he's hearing about. They've taken the things that he's taught them previously and they're putting them to work in his life in their life, excuse me. When we think about this idea that Paul wants them uh, to connect with God in that way, uh, to move from, I understand that I'm in Christ and that I'm in his family and I've been adopted, to what does that really mean for me and how I have a relationship with God, um, he kind of continues. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. See, Paul's prayer, I keep asking. He's continually praying for this church, even though he's apart from them. And he says that the thing he's praying for is that the God that they love and the God that has adopted them, that he'd be able to give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Wisdom and revelation, this idea that they would have a deep understanding, not just information, but, but in their person, understanding of what it means to be loved by God and to be known by God and to have relationship with him. Because isn't that the goal of our Christian faith? Isn't that the goal of our our relationship with God is that we continue to grow and to know him better? And here he's saying, yeah, that happens through connecting with God and knowing God and and spending time with God. And that we're going to pray for each other. Paul's going to pray for the the Church of Ephesians. We're going to pray for each other. That we would have just a sense of wisdom and revelation as we meet with God. That as we meet with him and as we walk out in our life, the things that we learn from the scriptures and that we're taught from the scriptures, that as we do that, God's print on us, uh, our, our understanding of the fact that we're image bearers would just grow and deepen as we live that kind of life. Well, one of the things that's really true is that we can sometimes get trapped in, in an intellectual face, faith or a, a faith that's wrapped around knowing more, doing more Bible studies so I can gain more information. Uh, memorizing scripture. I remember doing that as a kid, memorizing scripture in, in Awana. So many of our kids have memorized so many verses. And, and even this spring, I'm really excited uh, to have seen on Facebook so many of our kids who are finishing TNT and um, they, they finished all of their, their, their books. But our hope for our kids, right, is that it wouldn't stay there, that because that word is now in their life, that God would let it be come out in their life and, and be expressed in their life. Well, I've invited our student ministry pastor, Jake Schneiderhand, to tell us a little bit about his story today. And so uh, as we cut to that video, I want you to just give your attention to his words and his story and how it plays into what Paul is speaking to us here. So after years of growing up, going to church and hearing the stories and memorizing verses, uh, I finally in high school was part of a ministry that really was interested in students owning their own faith. And that's actually part of the reason why I do what I do today and work with high school and middle school students in student ministries. But the reality is I was about 17 years old and I was getting ready to go on my first mission trip. My youth pastor had challenged me to step out of my comfort zone and do a number of things leading up to the trip. And it it really at that time was when I began to realize that church isn't about Uh, information isn't about memorizing things, but it's actually about allowing God to change my heart. And and taking that information from my head to my heart is is one of the hardest journeys that, that, uh, that any of us can go through. But once it gets in there, you start living a little bit different, right? Because you, you can read a verse and see what it says, 
But then when you live out the verse and you start trying to actually go, what does it actually mean to walk like Jesus walked? And so when I was 17, I actually lived in the neighborhood just down the street from Matson, And I walked up to Matson one evening and, uh, and texting had just really become a thing. So I, I turned off my phone and set it down on the ground. And I walked out and I sat in the middle of the field at Matson, And I said, God, what, a, what do you have for me? And I said, God, what's, what's next for me? What's more than information, but what about my life? And I had spent some time recently studying Acts chapter 2, and I thought, God, I want to go to a church that's like that, and I want to live like that. I don't just want to have information. I don't just want to have ideas that feel good, but I actually want to live in a way that's different. I want to live like the community in Acts chapter 2 where they're looking out for one another, where they're loving each other, where they're loving the poor, where they're loving people that are uh, on the outside, or where they're loving minorities, and where they're giving, and when they're doing things differently. And God, I want you to use me to do things differently. And I'll tell you what, I never looked back from that. That summer I went on that mission trip, and I've been on countless other trips, and been employed in churches ever since then. But I do distinctly remember that evening as the night that, man, the information that I had been studying moved from my head to my heart. And that's what we're talking about today. Well, I really appreciate Jake's uh, story because it so captures what Paul is trying to, to speak into the life of the Ephesian church. They did never want them to be caught up in and just knowing their position in Christ, that they were in him, but they really wanted to, he really wanted them to see it expressed in, in how they were living and really fanning the flames of they have faith and they love and he's already thanked them for that. It's already been a motivation for him to connect with them because of the reports he was hearing. And I think this book, in many ways, is just him fanning the flame that they would continue to do more. And he writes here in, in, this, uh, in chapter 1, uh, verse 18, he says, I pray also. I love that phrase, I pray also. So he's already identified in 16 and 17 that he's praying for them and he's continuing to pray for them. That the wisdom and revelation, that they would know God better. But then in verse 18, he continues, I pray also, what? That the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. See, Jake's story captures this this transition that can happen in our life when we know God, but then we really know him. Like we know him enough to be convinced of the evidence that, that Jesus is who he says he is and that God did what he said he would do in raising Jesus from the dead and that through him we can have new life and and we can be adopted into his family, that we're welcomed to be in his family as we know Christ. But sometimes it can get stuck there. And what Jake shared with us was that journey that he went on where he had this relationship with God, where he really wanted to connect his heart with God's heart. And that's what's happening here in this, this idea of uh, praying for the eyes of your heart to be enlightened. Maybe you didn't know that your, your heart has eyes. In that first section, sometimes we think about that as uh, my mind's eye, like my ability to understand something. Like when I'm conversing with somebody and having a conversation and I finally like, oh, in my mind's eye, I can finally see what you were trying to tell me. Like something finally dawns on me and I have an understanding in my head. And here he's saying, I want to pray that the eyes of your heart, the very core of who you are and what you're about, would be opened up to really see God for who he is. Because what? Because when our, the eyes of our hearts are open and we've been enlightened, we discover things here that Paul addresses. In, uh, in verse 18, the second pa- half of that eight, uh, verse 18, he says that we would know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Three things that he really wants us to be captured by in our relationship with God when our heart is connected to God's heart. And one is that we would have great hope, that we would have great hope in God. And, you know, hope, so many definitions, so many things that we hope for. Uh, I hope that uh, re- soon I will be able to get back to uh, my normal routines. Um, I hope that I will be able to go out to my favorite restaurants and instead of getting takeout, be able to sit down and eat. Um, I hope that I get to grow old and, uh, and have ki- grandkids and great-grandkids and to be able to play with them and know them. I have hope that some of these things will happen for me. And I think about the idea of hope. Hope is a, uh, a positive expectation of a hoped-for future reality. A positive expectation for a hoped-for future reality. And I think about this idea that God wants us to, uh, 
um, to know the hope to, that he's called us to, that he wants us to know that, that what he's prepared for us in relationship with him, man, it's amazing that God has such great adventure in the Christian faith for us, that as we live this life here, that Lord, the Lord wants to do incredible work through us in the way that the Ephesians church was, was demonstrating faith and love for the saints. And Paul is saying so much more that on that journey and in that relationship along the way that God wants to uh, instill in us an inner motivation and an inner drive to want to get up and to do the things that God has planned for us. That we would have a sense of, of that incredible hope that we can have in God for what is our expected future. He also says the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Now, sometimes we think about an inheritance, uh, we think about what we might receive when our older relatives die, and they've hopefully written us into their will that I'm going to receive a check of some kind. If I told you that I had an inheritance and I had access and I could write you a check and my estate could write you a check for a billion dollars, who wouldn't be excited about that? Many, many people would be excited to receive that kind of an inheritance. Just so you know, that's not going to happen with my heirs. But this idea of inheritance, we think about what we're going to receive when we get an inheritance. And some people read this passage in that way. But as I've studied and I've considered, I've come to a different conclusion that many other people also come to, and it's this. That we would know when the eyes of our hearts are enlightened, when we're really connected with God's heart, that we would recognize that, um, that the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints is really speaking about our value as people that we are God's inheritance. That he laid down his one and only son. He paid a high price to purchase for us the opportunity to have new relationship with him. And now we've been adopted into his family. And there will be a day when, when all of this comes to an end here on earth as we see it now, and we will be with God completely. And in that day when God welcomes all of us who know him, who are in Christ, we've talked about that a lot, when he welcomes all those who are in Christ, there will be such a great reunion and God's heart will swell, I believe, with pride um, over those who have called him his own. And so we think about this, God is placing great value on us by calling us his inheritance. Of all the things that God could inherit, of all the things that at the end of time could be God's, he says we are his greatest treasure. We often try to find value in so many things in our life. We find value in relationships that we have with other people. We might find value in skills that we've built. Uh, having a resume, I was just joking with uh, the team earlier today as we began this recording process that uh, uh, I've done a lot of things on stage in church. I've prayed and I've baptized people and I've preached and I've done interviews with missionaries and other things like that. Uh, I've done all kinds of things on stage. The one thing I've not really gotten to do is to lead worship. Now, I'm pretty sure y'all don't want me to lead worship. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be really great. It wouldn't be nearly what Steve and the rest of the team bring us every week. But wouldn't it look good on my resume? Not that I'm going anywhere, because I'm not. But if I were to write a resume, how awesome would that be? That I could do everything, right? So we find value in our skills and in our resume. We find value in, in uh, material things, things that we've accumulated, things that... Uh, that we have stored up in our bank accounts and in our garage and on the shelves at home and in our driveway. And there's all kinds of things that we would maybe consider our value wrapped around. But here, Paul wants us to see that our value really is driven from this idea that God sees us as his inheritance. And that in that, he's imprinted on us a value that's so much different from the things that we value. The scriptures tell us in the beginning in Genesis chapter 3, uh, that we were created in God's image. We're image bearers of, of him. And, and in that, he's given us value just simply because that's how he's made us. But now I feel like that value has been added to because he's welcomed us into his family out of brokenness and emptiness and separation from him. And now we're his. And we have this new identity. And that drives a little bit of that motivation. My heart connecting with his gets me out of bed in the morning I know that no matter what happens today, I'm important to God. You're important to God. Well, he says this third thing that he hopes for will happen when we have the eyes of our heart enlightened, and that's that we would, uh, let's see here, in verse uh, 19 it says, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. He wants us to know this incomparably great power for those of us who believe. 
Man, as we think about power, there are so many things in life that, uh, that we hunger to have power in and people hunger to have power in. We can look at politics, po- politics and business. Uh, we can look in even in our own families. Uh, we can look in a lot of different, our neighborhood, all kinds of places where we might want to grasp at having some kind of power. But that's not the kind of power that God is speaking about here. This incomparably great power for those of us who believe. Well, then he tells us about that power. He, he continues on. That power is like what? The working of his mighty strength. Man, that's like the, the energy that it takes to move something forward. God's mighty strength. Uh, that Greek word is just so rich in about this idea that God wants to move with great energy, move something forward. That we, the liking of his mighty strength, what? Which exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. How awesome is that? That God's mighty power. You know, Jesus, we think about being, Jesus being raised from the dead, uh, sometimes people will uh, attribute that to Jesus himself. Like he went into the grave and then he raised from the dead because it was him who came out of the grave. But he's not the one who did the work of resurrection. It's actually the father who raised Jesus from the dead. He's the one who did the work and exercised his great power to bring him back from death to life. And that's what the gospel really is all about. And that's what this power is really all about, is taking things that are dead and giving them new life. And we spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to fix things that are dead and things that don't work. And uh, we look for power in places where, uh, where it's not really going to bring us life. But here, here, the Father wants us to know as we read this passage that it was he, w- he was the one that, that brought Jesus back to life. And that power he used to bring Jesus back to life, Paul is telling us is being given to us. That you and I have access to that power in our life because we are in him. We also find this about the power of God, this mighty strength that he exerted. We find this. He says, uh, uh, Far above all rule and authority. Oh, sorry, so let me skip back. Uh, verse 20, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And what? Seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Not only did he raise Christ from the dead, but then he installed him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Jesus is reigning and ruling next to God the Father. This is a great kingdom that we've been invited into. And Jesus is ruling in that kingdom. And it's because of God's power at work that he's placing him in that role. In verse 21, it says, Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given. That's an amazing amount of power. Not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. Jesus has complete rule and reign and authority now and forever. And God placed all these things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. See, God raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand and gave him rule over all all of these uh, authorities and power and dominion, and he placed everything under his feet. And that's a word picture for us. We think about somebody ruling and sitting on a, on a throne, that those who come to the throne and then bow their knee is this idea that the person who sits on the throne, um, who has the mantle of leadership or the mantle of, of being the king, has all of the power and has all of the authority. And that's exactly what Paul is telling us here is that, that Jesus has authority and has power over our lives and in our lives. And God placed all these things under his feet and what? Appointed him to be the head over everything for the church. And that's the beauty of what we can uh, lean on right now is that Jesus is the head of the church. Such an amazing passage that helps us to understand uh, his role and what happens with us as his church. It says here that we are his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And so for the last eight or nine weeks or however long it's been, We've lost track of the days and what month we're in and uh, in this COVID-19 season. Uh, but what we know is that we've not been able to meet in our church building. And I know that there's a, a longing for us to be able to gather here and to be a part of, of something that we had before. And, and I hope, that word, right? I hope that that will be true for us uh, soon, in the near future. But until that time comes, I don't ever want us to forget. I don't want to forget. I personally don't want to forget that this building that we're in that I'm in preaching from today is not the church. See, the church, although the doors are locked here and our campus is closed for ministry, the church has never been closed because wherever God's people gather together is the church. So this morning, 
Faith Church is showing up in living rooms and family rooms and on computer screens and phones all over our region. Because wherever you are with others, you are the church. I am the church. And Jesus is our head. He's the one who has rule over our church. So today, in the intro to our session this morning, uh, Brian just noted that Chris and Sonny Larson uh, have now landed in Austin and are off to the next adventure that God has planned for them. And we are uh, sad to say that, uh, that Ron and, and Lisa Larson are also stepping off of our team. And uh, we said a farewell to them a few minutes ago. Uh, and so that leaves some room for what is God going to do next at Faith Church? And you know what? I have great confidence about what God is going to do next at Faith Church because I read here that Jesus is the one who's really the head of the church. My trust, my complete trust is in him. That God has given Jesus authority to rule over the church and has placed him as the head of the church. And because of that, I can follow. That he's got the plan in mind. You know, the plan originates in our mind, right? That we sit down to scratch out a plan for how something might happen and how might, something might unfold. And Jesus, he has a plan. He's not surprised. He's not wondering what comes next. He already knows. And he's already putting in motion the things that he wants to do uh, in us and through us here at Faith Church. And so I read this passage and I go, God, as my heart connects with your heart, as I move from, from really understanding my position that I'm adopted into your family and I really connect with, with possessing and, and owning for myself this relationship that I have with you, I can say with great confidence that I trust you, God. Because my hope comes from the Father and my value and who I am comes from the Father. And the power that I have to live not only as a single Christian who's following him, but as a part of a, a greater body that we call Faith Church, that the power to live within that body and for us to express our, express our faith and our love to others, yeah, it's all wrapped up in Jesus' authority. That that power comes from God through Christ and the work of his Holy Spirit in us. And so this morning, as we thought about these things and, and we consider these things, uh, I, I just want to remind each of us that uh, w- when we have a relationship with God, he desires for us to move from some kind of mental understanding of who he is and what he's about and to really every day engage our heart with his heart. Uh, a bunch of years ago, I read a book by an author named Brennan Manning. And Brennan Manning was a, a priest and a pastor and an alcoholic and homeless and uh, had lots of brokenness in his life. But he was also somebody who was an amazing follower of God, who loved God and saw God do many redeeming things in his life. And he wrote about this. And a number of years ago, Brennan Manning was at a, uh, at a spiritual retreat center on the East Coast and he had a spiritual mentor who was meeting with him and working with him. And Brennan was really struggling with this idea of like, what does it mean for me to really know God? Does he want to know me? Does he know the brokenness of my life and who I am? And his spiritual mentor encouraged him to pray a prayer and to keep praying it until he believed it. Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 10. Song of Solomon is about a husband and a wife and it's an amazing book. And in that book, the woman speaks of her, of her lover and saying, I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. That one verse, I, Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 10. I am my beloved's and his desire is for me. And Brennan began to pray this prayer that I'm God's and his desire is for me. And it had nothing to do with what he, what he did. It had nothing to do with his performance. It had nothing to do with, with uh, whether he prayed enough or read enough scripture or memorized enough or went to church enough. It simply helped Brennan recenter himself on this idea that this idea that God simply wants us. He wants relationship with us. And so when Paul writes this pas- passage to the Ephesian church, he does want us to know our position in God, in Christ. All these amazing things, verses 3 through 14. But he also wants us to take all of those amazing things and connect our heart to God's heart so that they might be able to be expressed in the life that he's given us. And so I invite us today, as we think about this, to to consider that question, what is my source of hope? What is my source of value? What is my source of power in my life? For me, I believe it is the Father through Jesus Christ and the work of his Spirit in me. And that's my hope for us at Faith Church, that that would be true for you. It's been great to be in this passage together today, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to where we're going to go for the rest of the summer 
And I've asked Jake to come back and just close us out for today as he responds to the passage and he prays us out. Uh, but thanks for letting me share these thoughts with you from Ephesians chapter 1. Man, I am so grateful to Weston for walking us through part three of the Ephesians series. I personally am really excited about this summer and hearing from the variety of voices that we'll be hearing from. But today, as I leave, I'm asking myself, what are my sources of hope, value, and power? My prayer is that, that God will weed out the things that I'm putting in place of Him. And uh, what I want to do now to close this out is I want to pray the same thing for you. Let me pray. God, thank you so much uh, just for your word that is encouraging. God, this week uh, in my life and in each of our lives, can you, can you meet with us? And can you point out the things that we're allowing to give us hope or that we think are giving us value and power? And God, can you uh, help us move you into those places? God, we are grateful that, uh, that you are on journey with us. And maybe we remember that today and this week. In your son's name we pray. Amen.